Hello and welcome to today's authors. This is a special program featuring authors as originators of almost anything. Art, architecture, uh, books about politics. We could actually talk to a politician. Uh, sometimes when I'm talking to James Howard Gunsler, I'm not sure if I'm talking to a politician or a painter, but I think he's both, and probably a lot of other things. Jim, great to see you. Nice to be here, Nice Gary. to see you. Um, I uh, have been reading some of your stuff. Of course, I've read a lot of your stuff mm -hmm. over the years, but the, the latest thing that I've read is uh, The Long Emergency, mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, it's a seminal work uh, in terms of where we are, and uh, based on an old story, 150 years old or so, dating from about 1859, and that's oil. Oil, yeah. So what's the deal? Well, the deal is that we're getting into trouble with oil. We're not running out of oil, but we're heading down the depletion arc of oil, and it's going to get us into a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, the, the, the oil story... For most people, uh, you know, they think about, uh, we're going to run out. That's not what it's about. It's about the complex systems that we depend on uh, becoming unstable and wobbling and failing as this process occurs. And by complex systems, I mean very precisely the way we feed ourselves, you know, industrial agriculture, the way we do commerce and trade and manufacturing, you know, the basis of our economy or what used to be. The way we do capital finance, that is the way we um, accumulate wealth and deploy it for productive purposes, and that, that's also known as banking. Uh, the way we do transportation, yeah. you know, the way we, that, which means the way we move around the landscape. The way we inhabit the landscape, which means you know land development and, and uh, uh, urban design and, and all of those issues. And I was very involved with those issues myself. For about 10 years, I wrote three books about the fiasco of suburbia and, and the remedies for it. You know, and, and that sort of led me into this inquiry about the, the energy situation because obviously suburbia was entirely dependent on our oil supply. And not, not just the, the oil supply, but the continued uh, 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 abundant supply of cheap oil because that's really the key to it. And uh, it became clear in the process of writing those three books, The Geography of Nowhere, Home from Nowhere, and The City in Mind, became clear that we were heading for trouble. And then around the same time, in the uh, middle to late 90s, something happened. A group of senior geologists retired out of the major oil companies. And they began to publish their dark secret thoughts about where the oil industry was headed. And they began to issue warnings. And Hubbard's one of those guys. Well, right? Hubbard, uh, yes. He, Hubbard lived a long time. He, he actually died in the late 80s. But the, the, uh, the men and women who had studied with him, who were his, his students, who, who later became the chief geologists for the major oil companies, uh, they're still with us, and they have retired now, people like Colin Campbell and Kenneth DeFaze at Princeton, etc. And they began, you know, they're not really exciting figures, they're not political, you know. They began publishing monographs and magazine articles and obscure journals and, and, and books. But um, it became clear that we were facing this, this problem, which was, became gathered under the rubric of peak oil. And... Um, you know, what we're seeing now in uh, the ostensible uh, collapse, sort of slow motion train wreck of industrial economies, and in particular the American economy, um, is the, uh, the result of the implications of the peak oil and peak energy story. Do, do you think that, uh, in your studies of these guys' writings and things, that in, in terms of the audience, I mean, you're, you're sort of a translator. Uh, yeah. At, when you go out and talk to people, I mean, one of the things that, that you do is go out and talk to groups and everything. At, what's the response? I mean, is it, it, are, are people really into your, your message, but they don't really want to act on it? No, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a very troubling thing, and it's a troubling period in American life. I think perhaps maybe in, in Western culture, per se. Um, we're having a very hard time forming a coherent consensus about what's happening to us 
and what we're going to do about it. You, you think we've got to form a consensus? Well, um, uh, societies generally don't, uh, societies are generally not moved to action to change their behavior unless they, they can form a general agreement about what's going on. And, and until that happens, you either end up in denial and paralysis or in factional fighting. And we're seeing both of that in the USA today. Um, the bottom line is we have to change the way we do things in this country uh, at every level and, and in all of these areas that I described. You know, we're going to have to grow our food differently. We're going to have to grow it closer to, closer to home on a smaller scale in a way that probably will require more human attention. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do commerce differently than Walmart because that formula is going to fail. Uh, you know, and, and, and the global uh, economic arrangements that go under the name of globalism will fail with it. Um, we're going to have to do transportation differently because the whole happy motoring nexus of activities is going to stop working for us the way it has been designed to work. We're going to have to inhabit the landscape differently because suburbia is going to fail. So, you know, you can see a pretty comprehensive picture uh, of what we're facing and, and this inability to form an agreement among all the players in our society about really what to do is a, a tremendous uh, uh, problem. Well, can, can you break that down a little? I mean, I mean, in terms of hooking up the big general idea and the context and everything, I, I think if people have been reading and watching uh, serious documentaries and, and talking with uh, experts about this, it's sort of a no-brainer. Now, like no, no, let me give you an example but, of, of yeah, what, what I think you're driving at, okay? Because... Yeah. Because this is a really... Uh, it's uh, very... I go... Uh, for the last two years, I've gone to the Aspen Environmental Forum, you know, where the cream of the cream of the environmentalists of the USA and, to some extent, the world gather in every spring for a confab. And, you know, we face this tremendous problem with oil, with f transportation fuels, um, and um, with the ecology uh, and with the economic ecology of our society, you know how it's going to function, whether civilization will continue. And you know, oddly enough, when you get to Aspen, the only thing that these guys want to talk about is how we're going to run the cars by other means. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's the only, and, and it shows how paralyzed we are and how unable we are to come up with a coherent picture of what's going on. Now, I, I say this because. One of the most important projects that we could do right now, right away, as a society, collectively, would be to repair the passenger railroad system in this right. country, you know? It's there. It's there. It's out there rusting in the rain, waiting to be fixed. We don't have to reinvent anything. Uh, and yet, we're unable to bring ourselves to this point. In fact, it's not even in the discussion. It wasn't part of the 2008 presidential election. It's not being talked about. And, and we're not going to solve this problem by finding other ways to run the cars, because that ain't going to happen. But, the, you know, this shows the nature of the paralysis that we're in. The, you know, and and when, when you hear any talk about the railroads at all, it's, it's tech, what I call techno-grandiosity. You know, we want to do high-speed rail. Yeah. But guess what? We can't afford that. We're bankrupt. We can't build a new parallel uh, track system that has different curve ratios and gradients and things, you know, that has to be totally built from scratch. We need to fix the stuff that was there in 1953 and make it run again. And you know something? People would be delighted to be able to get on a train and go 75 miles an hour between Albany and Boston or between Columbus and Cleveland, you know? It doesn't have to be 300 miles an hour, but we can't even politically get ourselves to that point. These are the kinds of problems that if we do not face them squarely, we're going to be in living in a world of hurt and disorder.